Our first plenary session is being chaired by Dr. Shafiqur Rahman, Vice Chancellor, University of Haripur. And our first keynote speech is being presented by Dr. Wang Liebing, who I now invite to the rostrum. The title of his keynote speech is Unveiling the Potential of Small Language Models for AI Integration in Higher Education. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, again for the opportunity to join this uh, meeting. And my presentation uh, will be about a small language model. Uh, basically, I, I'm, I'm not a technical person. Uh, I'm, I used to be a professor of uh, competitive education. I, I'm specializing in higher education, but I'm not a te technology person. But for this presentation, it was prepared jointly by me and another colleague who are specialized in uh, artificial intelligence. I think I have prepared the full text, especially for this meeting. And it will be published very soon uh, on the University World News. So I will be sharing with you the full text of, uh, of this article. Uh, I think what I would like to, to see is that the proliferation of generative AI, as exemplified by large language models such as GPT, Lama, Palm, and Cloud, has sparked an arms race among tech companies as they fight to develop ever larger, more powerful systems. Despite initial skepticism and caution, higher education systems and institutions have embraced the advantages of generative AI. However, it is crucial to acknowledge the flip side of this technological advancement. Leveraging large language models, LLMs, demands substantial energy and infrastructure resources, presenting obstacles to both the environmental and the sustainability and adaptability of AI integration in higher education. The introduction of small language models, whether integrated into a larger ecosystem, um, alongside AOLMs or operating independently, offers in immense potential in taking these challenges. Um, Recently, we have uh, witnessed the launch of a number of small language models, uh, which is uh, such as Microsoft Phi 2 and, uh, and Google Gemini Nano. They are the systems with much reduced parameters and the train, training data sets. You can see much more smaller uh, than their LLM counterparts. This compact design of SLMs enables them to operate efficiently on less powerful hardware platforms using a fraction of powers typically required. These SLMs are also easy to deploy locally and will improve accessibility and uh, reduce the need for extensive infrastructure support. SLMs may yet need to reach the low performance levels of LLMs in handling highly complex tasks. However, initial reports suggest they can perform com comparatively well on narrower tasks, if adequately trained and fine-tuned. This characteristic makes the technology particularly well-suited for industrial-specific applications within well-defined knowledge domains. As a result, pilot programs to integrate 
small language models have been launched in various industries, including legal, medical, and financial services. Higher education emerges as another domain, another domain where SLMs serving as subject-specific generative AI tools could wield substantial influence. Once trained on subject or task-specific data sets or armed with customized algorithms, these models can be invaluable tools for supporting teaching, learning, and research. Um, I think it's also uh, quite clear that small language model is very helpful in reducing carbon free footprint of, of higher education institutions. As you know, the journey towards carbon neutrality for higher education institutions uh, involves three main steps. First is to establishing comprehensive carbon inventories. Second, monitoring and managing emissions. And the third, mitigating their impact through offsetting measures. A comprehensive carbon footprint assessment should cover all facets of university operations, such as teaching, research, social engagement, institutional governance, and the digitalization initiatives. Given generative AI's significant environmental impact, special attention should be given to its sustainable integration within these metrics. Since the introduction of large language models, there have been a notable trend where users increasingly resort to these advanced technologies for solutions to given tasks, regardless of the skill and the specificity of their queries. In many cases, such uses patterns can be compared to blasting a cannon to thwart a mosquito, resulting in unnecessary internet traffic and heightened computing power and energy consumption, as each prompt may entail substantial processing uh, behind the scene. The energy intensity of large language model stems from their immersive ability to sift through fast data sources in, pursuing, in pursuit of delivering versatile and accurate results. This capability involves the exhaustive examination and the processing of large volumes of unfiltered data, which is essential to the effectiveness of these models, but demands considerable computational resources and leads to significant energy consumption. While SM, SLM technology is still in its infancy, it offers promising potential for higher education institutions seeking greener alternatives for their generative AI integration. SLMs are well recognized for their lower energy consumption, providing a low emission options for higher education institutions to look, looking to minimize their carbon footprint and re reinforcing their commitment to sustainability. Second, small advantage of small language model will be helpful in addressing the digital divide among countries. In regions and the nations with very limited digital infrastructure and the resources, as in the Global South countries, the accessibility of SLMs is essential. The modest resource requirements of SLMs 
can indeed extend their availability to a wide range of users. This promising accessibility can effectively bridge the digital divide and facilitate equitable access to AI technology in higher education. Although the global North countries continue to dominate the upstream technologies and platforms, global South countries can use small language models to cultivate homegrown AI tools and foster supportive local ecosystems. By leveraging local data sets and a tailored algorithm, global South countries can avoid falling behind in technological development and establish themselves as constructive forces in specific AI domains. Embracing the development of SLMs could inspire global South countries to create a, an Indian neighboring environment for nurturing indigenous AI talent, and as well as post-graduation uh, employment opportunities for the local talents. By prioritizing indigenous small language models um, adapted to linguistic and cultural relevance, AI literacy and the capacity building programs can equip individuals with the knowledge, um, with the knowledge um, to apply AI solutions in their communities effectively. So this is uh, um, what, um, and small language models present a, a strategic avenue for overcoming infrastructure uh, uh, limitations currently faced by global source countries. By facilitating the development of AI applications rooted in local expertise, small language models can foster the creation of technology customized to the unique needs and the challenges of these countries. This localized approach to AI tool development is critical to promoting inclusivity in higher education, ensuring that education resources and opportunities reach a wider population. Efforts to, to create such SLM tools can stimulate North, South, 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 and the triangular collaboration. This will con contribute to the emergence of a new global generative AI landscape that serves the common good of all nations. Otherwise, you know, this disparity will, will, will exist forever. Uh, I think the third area I would like to share with you is really the potential of small language model in protecting uh, privacy and the data security. As you know, what we are seeing about artificial intelligence is basically, basically supported by three elements. First is big data, like food. And the machine learning algorithm is the way to process food, and then supported by companies by computing powers. Uh, as the saying goes, whoever owns the data owns the future. Large language models such as GPT rely on aggregating data from multiple sources and interacting with user-provided information. However, this reliance can pose significant challenges for higher education institutions in terms of protecting privacy and data security. In response to these concerns, it is essential to establish robust data governance framework that incorporate diverse data sets ownership models and the stringent privacy and the data security protocols. The, adapt the adaptability of smaller language model for on-site deployment 
makes them particularly well suited to this strategy, enabling higher education institutions to maintain great control over data usage. This is particularly important for AI applications involving students, data, and other sensitive information. When properly trained and optimized with relevant data sets, small language models become powerful tools from which higher education institutions can derive significant benefits. To unlock this potential, higher education institutions must establish comprehensive data management frameworks covering institutional, faculty, subject, and the program levels. I, I think higher education institutions, you are generating big data every day. You are generating big data every day. And it should be well categorized to cover all the areas of university operation. And this is really the asset of higher education institutions because computing power, internet transmission speed is a public infrastructure, right? It's not depending on, on, on institutional capacity. But what universities and college, what you have is really the, the data sets that you have, you collected. Uh, so this is really very, very important. And then if we can make use of this uh, public infrastructure to train small language model, it's, it's going to be very efficient and also serve the purposes. Uh, just let you know that actually, uh, I heard that UNESCO is also training uh, uh, AI tools uh, fed by all the data sets we have within UNESCO, right? So it is hoped that in the future, rather than people, these AI tools will have institutional memory of all UNESCO things, right? You can ask these AI tools uh, rather than, you know, there's no hot, hot desk, you no know, help, help line, all these kind of things. Uh, but it was trained with UNESCO data sets, right? So I think at the university level, it's also important. You, you have your own specific data sets. It's not only publications, but also some informal, you know, all these kind of memories, you know. So this can be used. Uh, I think higher education institutions need to invest in robust data system, prioritizing their ethical management, particularly in developing and utilizing small language models. This includes obtaining informed consent from campus constituents prior to any such data collection and a transparent communication of its purposes, uses, and privacy policies for informed decision making. Transparency builds trust, and the ethical standards are essential for responsible use of ICT, of, of, of small language models. So next, I would just want to talk a bit about the, the potential of small language model in promoting personalized learning. In contrast to a more generic, versatile, large language models, small language models can be trained on data sets tailored to the specific fields of study or teaching modalities. This customization results in outputs that, more, that are more relevant to learners' needs and can directly improve alignment with the learning outcomes. Small learning lang language models uh, can effectively fulfill various academic needs for students seeking generative AI support. This includes personalized learning, proofreading, research assistant, and content generation. Students can view these AI tools as a rich repository of essential publications in their fields and beyond. Learners can also come to regard them 
as knowledgeable supplementary mentors capable of efficiently delivering tailored and expert assistance. For university faculty members, small language models have the potential to streamline many labor-intensive tasks, allowing faculty to refine the models for customized purposes. In addition, small language models can also serve as key partners in pedagogical enhancement and innovation. Mentoring and supervision could reach more students using subject-based or task-specific small language model tool, especially in institutions with very limited staff. As small language models evolve, they have significantly, they have significant potential to inform, support, and promote open educational resources, and thereby facilitating wider dissemination of knowledge among institutions and students. We have a, a kind of anticipation that maybe in the future, uh, all MOOCs should be empowered by small language model, should be supported by small language model, should be empowered by artificial intelligence in the form of small language model. So MOOCs is no longer just upload of videos or PPTs, you know, it's actually a kind of uh, small language model. Uh, uh, finally, I would uh, uh, really to see um, um, Some, some, some call for action. I think we need to adopt this kind of fit for purpose approach. Small language models should not be seen as substitutes for large language model, but as complementary tools. Each has unique strengths and is well suited to specific purposes. As a result, institutions can optimize resource allocation by investing in a range of spe specialized small language models tailored to specific needs and objectives, rather than rely on a single unwieldy large language model for all purposes. Government have, have a critical role to play in helping users to navigate AI models they can establish regulatory frameworks that require the AI industry to prioritize sustainability, including energy efficiency certifications and the transparent reporting of environmental impacts. With clear standards and data, higher education institution users can effectively assess trade-offs in decision in deciding upon sustainable AI models. Higher education institutions should adopt a balanced approach, integrating both large language model and small language model while prioritizing sustainability and purposeful AI integration. For example, large language models may be essential for intri intricate and interdisciplinary research. While small language model might excel at domain-specific spe tasks and everyday applications, by defining and incorporating this various scenario, higher education institutions can harness the transformative potential of AI while reducing their carbon footprint. As model capabilities evolve, regular assessment of appropriate use cases is critical to ensure that uh, integration strategies can adjust as needed. As highlighted in the outcome statement of the recent UNESCO Asia Pacific Roundtable on gener Generative AI and Education, higher education institutions need to cultivate a culture of responsible and ethical use of artificial intelligence. This includes raising awareness that all generative content prompts 
queries and outputs have an environmental impact that is influenced by factors such as model scales, efficiency, and aggregate usage levels. Considering these factors, we can advance towards a more sustainable and customized AI integration in higher education. I think that's all from me. Uh, really, the main idea is just, just to think of uh, how to, uh, uh, you know, uh, develop uh, institutional-based, subject-specific uh, AI tools. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, in terms of data, big data, uh, data which is available on the internet is of high quality, right? Uh, my own use of uh, ChatGPT is that I'm, I'm only using it for, for proofreading. If you want it to write something for you, it's very bad. Totally cannot be trusted because of the database, right? So now it's really interesting, you know, if you can give the ChatGPT a very logic and a clear instruction, they will give you very good, good answers. Other than that, you know, you, you cannot count on, on it. I think in the future, uh, no internet, actually the data sets are, are really unfiltered, you know, with a lot of disinformation, you know. So that's the thing, you know, how to train uh, uh, AI tools is really a matter for us to think of. We should feed it with quality data, with subject-specific data, right? So. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe in the future, uh, the so-called institutional memory will be with AI tools rather than people. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang Libing. Our second keynote speech, Striving for Excellence, PSG 2023 as a Catalyst for Change, will be presented by Mr. Aves Ahmed, advisor GE and QA HEC. Bismillah rahmani rahim and very good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to present uh, PSG 2023 uh, to this valuable forum, which is, to me, is a hub of learning and sharing. Let me begin uh, with saying that quality is serious. It differentiates ordinary from the extraordinary. It is continuous and evolving, never saturates. And it's everyone's responsibility, regardless of size and significance. I will take you back uh, to a bit of history at the time of Establishment of Higher Education Commission in 2002. Higher Education Commission was established with the, for the evaluation, improvement and promotion of higher education, research and development in the country. And its mission was then set to facilitate institution of higher learning to serve as engine of growth for socioeconomic development of Pakistan. The core strategic aims that were set, uh, set at that time were uh, faculty development, improving access, promoting excellence in research and education, and then relevance. And at that time, quality was never thought as one of the core strategic aim, but it was a cross-cutting objective or aim along with development of leadership and governance and then physical and technological infrastructure. 
But over the years, HEC has implemented a strategic shift. Now, equitable access, quality, and relevance are the three core strategic objectives around which the entire fabric of higher education sector is built in Pakistan. Equitable access means improving access, more universities, increased enrollments, more teachers, more scholarships, distance learning, and obviously bringing the third year of education, the education awarded or taught at the level of affiliated institutions, which historically was the weakest link between the higher education sector, within the higher education sector of Pakistan. Then the quality, quality is something which has an international benchmark. So we, we are standing, setting standards and practices with in international standards, whether with regard to faculty, whether with regard to curriculum, whether with regard to research, the research funding mechanisms, the impact of research, capacity building for performance, ICT, and advancement in all these areas in order to produce world-class graduates employable locally, nationally, and internationally. And then come the very crucial part is the relevance. And relevance is how higher education and investment on this sector is contributing towards the well-being of not only the people of this country, but also the rest of the world. Because we live together in a bigger community. Innovation inventions bridging the gap are all covered within the domain of relevance as far as higher education is higher education sector in Pakistan is concerned. We started as uh, this morning chairman HEC told that by establishing some standards, standards for faculty, standards for launching MS and PhD programs in universities, some policies for plagiarism, general recognition systems, tenure track systems, and there is a long list of policies. But after a few years, in 2005 of, uh, of HEC establishment, then we established the Quality Assurance Agency. The primary job of that agency was to see how the quality is benchmarked and valued within the context of higher education institutions. And then came the establishment of quality enhancement cells. We, you have heard about these cells. There are currently 254 active quality enhancement cells in universities in Pakistan, both private and public. And then and the program review, program self-accreditation, institutional pro, uh, performance evaluation systems were introduced. Subsequently, with the cooperation and collaboration of British Council. We embarked on a project called Pakistan UK Education Gateway, which is a system to system association. And with, with UK agencies, we are working in a number of directions, which involves uh, building a framework for research in terms of excellence, research excellence framework in Pakistan, teaching excellence framework in Pakistan, and PSG precepts, standards, and guidelines for quality assurance in Pakistan is a product of that project. And this has been developed in deep consultation with UK Quality Assurance Agency, and the process has been a collaboration with international agency, then consultations with the vice chancellors, with the directors of quality enhancement cells, with the students and faculty in Pakistan. And now this framework is available and has all been, already been 
rolled out. But it is not something which is, which is static, which is in its final shape. It is a framework which is evolving, which is being uh, implemented. It's not, uh, the implementation has not started, but we are basically, we have introduced this framework to the universities and a number of consultative workshops with the QECs has already, have already been uh, taken place. What, what is so exciting about this framework is that it values improved transparency and accountability. It has well-defined reporting structures. It has monitoring and improvement arrangements built within these structures. It takes shift from faculty to students. It values student experiences and outcomes which has not been historically uh, a, a part or, or a consideration that reflected higher education quality in, in Pakistan. It, it is not static. It, it, it does not limit itself to conformity. It takes institutions, guide them to improve themselves from conformity to enhancement, enhancement of quality, enhancement of productivity, enhancement towards contribute, contribution for the development of society. And in, in, in later slide, slides, I will demonstrate that how this process actually uh, uh, takes place through uh, this framework. Then there is an emphasis on, uh, on contextual considerations. Different programs, different universities might have different challenges. So this framework allows them to localize considerations in, 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 in terms of their own needs and requirement, requirements and does not prescribe uh, one single solution to every, everyone. Then it's, it's, it's a collaborative, it, it, on the one hand, it provides an opportunity for hand-holding, on the other hand, it has developed institutional uh, mechanism whereby within a particular institution, within a community, of higher education institution and internationally, people can collaborate, contribute, handhold, and develop uh, the capacity of uh, uh, faculties and communities. The, the framework is built around four important components. If you look at the slide, uh, on top sits the PSG, which are the standards within, within uh, this framework. Then uh, uh, recap, it's, it's the review, reviewing effectiveness of quality assurance and accreditation bodies. And uh, 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 it's, it's reviewing effectiveness of quality assurance at the institution level and also of the accreditation bodies. Previously accreditation bodies quality was not a subject of quality assurance practices in, 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 in Pakistan. But in this framework, we are also going to look at the uh, quality assurance by the accreditation body. And HEC is also going to present itself for international evaluations in international accreditations uh, by, by, by neutral experts so that we become visible, we become accessible, and our standards are those which are recognized in accordance with the world standards. Then there are external quality assurance and internal quality uh, assurance, review of institutional performance and enhancement. These two, uh, and the pre, the program review and effectiveness for enhancements. These two processes sits within and outside external quality assurance by HEC and internal quality assurance by institutions themselves. So, Universities at their own are also supposed to review their program and institutional performance. And HEC is also going to review them. And eventually, we, through this framework, a platform, a digital platform would be available to the universities where they can look themselves, where they stand, and then HEC obviously would be looking at a larger picture where all universities, all institutions are mapped and, and, and a profiling of individual institutions become possible. So these are uh, various standards uh, within the process. Then each standard has 
uh, substandards. If you look at the detailed documents, I'm not going to uh, go through the list of these st standards, but you are reviewing effectiveness of QA agencies like what QA agency of HEC, as well as accreditation bodies. There are several accreditation bodies in Pakistan, nine established by the government of Pakistan and five established by the Higher Education Commission. Uh, similarly, uh, these are uh, uh, the uh, standards for program review and effectiveness and enhancement. Again, each standard has a substandard, and these are the standards where, which would then HEC as well as in, uh, universities would, would be looking at themselves. RIPE review of institutional performance and enhancement for IQA and EQA, both for internal and external quality assurance process. This, this is a very significant tool, and I, I, I would draw your attention towards uh, its, its distribution. It has uh, uh, 16 standards. Six are strategic development standards. Uh, then there are another set of six standards which are academic, relates uh, to academics and research, and then there are four uh, uh, standards which are for institutional development. And if you look at them in detail in, in, in the entire document, you will see that they are very elaborate and take you down into the process uh, rather than just attaching some numbers, yes or no, or uh, figures, and then provide an opportunity to rank a parameter uh, Within, within the uh, context of quality assurance mechanism. How the process work, and, and I, I think it's, it's, it's very crucial, and, and I will start by saying that there is a set of six principles on which this framework is built. Number one is the quality, everyone's responsibility. Quality and learning opportunities. Quality and contribution to the society quality and good governance, quality and accountability, quality and change. We have added quality and change, quality and accountability, that in their individual aspect, all these factors are very important. But how much they are effective in terms of building quality of an institution, this is, this is the principle on which this framework is uh, basically developed. The process is such that it prescribes standards, it lays down expectations, it identifies the indicators, expectation indicators. Then there is a review judgment matrix in which the evaluators are going to rank or rate uh, uh, an individual standard or a performance. Then it also guides, in, in, in comparison with international best practices, uh, how uh, you can modify and improve the quality ranking and build capacity for. Then it has a, cycl a cyclic quality improvement mechanism, institutional ment mentoring programs, so that more and more universities and institutions can work together with each other in terms of building quality. This is the process which I, I, I would like to read from the slide for better understanding. Standard, for example, one standard is public information and transparency. The expected outcome indicator provides, ensure the availability of transparent mechanism for all these stakeholders, particularly students, faculty, have access not only to decisions made, but also to processes and procedures of decisions. Then indicative evidence for this would be communicating policies, agenda, working papers, forums, members, information, etc. And the guideline or the best practice for this would be develop transparent policies with well-defined scope and objectives and engagement of stakeholders. Centralized information hub with regular communication, publicized decision making, timelines, feedback mechanism, conflict of interest policies. So you can see that the framework actually demonstrate that how you can really move on the quality ladder and improve the effectiveness of each and every standard within the context of that standard. This is the review judgment matrix. 
and what I particularly emphasize is that it, it protects dignity and respect of individual higher education institutions. If you look at the framework in which this matrix or evaluation has been displayed is effective improvement retained. These are the higher education institutions would, which would be at the top of the quality ladder. And these institutions would be rated as affected, effective, green. And there's review cycle by external quality assurance agencies such as HECQAA would be five years. And their self-accreditation cycle, which is working within the institution, would be biennial every two years then. Uh, th this is, this is the, the, would be the institutions which would top the uh, quality benchmarks. Then limited improvement retained. These are the next level of higher education institution. Uh, we call them progressive institutions rather than effect effective. Here the review cycle, external review cycle would be four years and every year there would be a self-assessment. Then there is adequate improvement required is the third level of uh, institutions which we rate them as average and or ineffective Review cycle external is three years, and then uh, there is uh, will be institutional mentoring program uh, uh, developed and implemented for such institutions and biennial self-assessment. At the bottom are the institutions where significant improvement is required. They would be uh, colored as gray, and and there every two years they would be monitored or evaluated externally, and. Again, they will have an institutional mentoring program as well as yearly self-assessment uh, carried out. This is um, uh, how the system would enable for universities to perform better. Uh, Performance-based accreditation cycle. Universities, when accredited by the external agencies as well as internally, based on performance on standards that are internationally compatible have greater probability of being recognized nationally as well as internationally. There are institutional monitoring, mentoring programs available within the universities so that they can handhold and guide each other in climbing up the ladder. Then they customize policy interventions. You know that in Pakistan, there is a variety of universities and variety of challenges. So each university would then have, have the, uh, the choice to f develop its own quality assurance policy through establishment of institutional quality circles chaired by the vice chancellor of a particular university with all deans and HODs sitting on it and then developing uh, uh, a framework through which it, that the quality challenge is uh, addressed. Through greater national and accredited, uh, international accreditation, there is a greater probability for research investment, research capacity building, and so is the case with performance grant funding by HEC as well as uh, similar uh, advantages that the responsible universities or effective improvement retained the top quality universities would uh, be eligible for by the higher education uh, commission. This is the process which is taking place at the moment. We have basically uh, completed the phase one or phase A of uh, this policy. We are currently in phase two. Uh, from sixth of this month, a workshop, there would be six workshops, uh, consultative workshops of QECs. The one is kicking off at National University of Science and Technology, Islamabad. It's from 6, 7th, and 8th of this month. And then there would be training of professionals and faculty, and there's uh, uh, a statutory position by the master trainers. Uh, then would be the uh, third process, which is actually uh, concurrently being uh, implemented, is the development of automation uh, pro, uh, process or a platform uh, where, uh, where, whereby the institutions as well as higher education commission can review and implement, uh, see the implementation of, of this program and institution as well as higher education com commission can profile institution based on their own uh, uh, performance uh, in, in terms of quality. 
then there is a training uh, undertaken by the UK QA agencies and then pilot testing of this program and then capacity development facilitation for continuous review and monitoring. So the, these four phases will, uh, will complete in next uh, six to uh, 12 months. And even then after the completion of these phases, this program would, would continue to evolve through experience, through uh, uh, cooperation and advice of the higher education institution as well as as the world higher education sector transform it, this framework will keep on adopting the expectations from HEIs of obviously is that they first understand this framework which is aligned with the international best practices then establish institutional quality circle with this is this is very important now this is this circle is led by the vice chancellor and then analyze gaps which exist allocate resources then obviously uh, engaging with the stakeholders the next step is alignment and adaptation by the universities then implementation and monitoring and then review and enhancement so this this framework is is something which is living which is continuously evolving guiding universities as well as HEC, that how they can continuously align themselves with international best practices, as well as demonstrate that their programs, their research is relevant for the country, for the employability of its graduates, and for service to the society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vais. The third keynote speech for today, key trends in higher education, are our accreditation and QA approaches ready or outdated? Will be presented by Dr. Francisco Marmolejo, President Higher Education Qatar Foundation. Thank you very much. And again, <clears throat> many thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation to participate at uh, today's uh, session. So believe it or not, I will be speaking about too many things that are not precisely related to the whole issue of quality, but try to step forward and then to think about issues, events, trends that are happening in higher education which it is very important for us in our community to take a look into them because we like it or not, those will influence significantly the shape of higher education and consequently the role that quality assurance should play on these uh, uh, new realities. So let me try to coordinate this. Uh, there are of course good news. And the good news is that uh, you know, we like it or not, we live in a world which is increasingly interconnected, is increasingly educated, and also is increasingly integrated. And of course, all of that are good news for higher education. Because at the end of the day, that means that higher education matters. On the other side, of course, there are also bad news. And the bad news is that we live in a world which is increasingly uninformed. It is increasingly unequal. And also it is increasingly polarized. And believe it or not, this is a fertile land as well for more and better higher education. Because it provides to all of us a unique opportunity precisely to make of our higher education landscape much more effective in responding to these challenges that we have today. Of course, there are also challenging news. And those are that, honestly, we don't know, despite you know, all the voices of the experts, let me see, we don't know how all these changes that are happening in the world will impact 
what higher education will be in the future. And of course, it is not clear how our colleges and universities will be adapting and how our quality assurance systems also will be adapting to these new realities. So think about the economy and society. Our economy and society is increasingly global. It is also highly competitive. It is becoming more and more technologically driven. Our economy and society also, it is constantly changing. And probably the most important factor is that our economy and society in the world is increasingly based in knowledge. Let me just give you one example of that. So we can use very sophisticated econometric models to see how globalized is the economy in today's world. But I found a simpler way to describe that. And this is uh, a bottle of Mexican salsa. I'm from Mexico. And in Mexico, we like to eat spice food. And the spicy food is the Mexican salsa. So what this bottle has extraordinary? Well that it was made not in Mexico, but in the Netherlands. So we have someone here from the Netherlands. For me, it was a surprise to learn that in the Netherlands, they can make Mexican masala, right? Um, with ingredients from Morocco. It was commercialized by a Chinese company. And I purchased that bottle of Mexican masala when I was living in India, in New Delhi. So this is an excellent way to describe how globalized is not only the economy, but also even the flavors of the taste of each of the countries. It is a world which is also increasingly interconnected. What we are talking about right now, it is being transmitted live to the rest of the world. So, you know, time doesn't matter anymore. We live in a world which is also increasingly fascinating. You know that many of the discoveries that will happen in the world in the next year will change completely the way that we conceive the world. And of course, this fascination is related to technology. Um, you know, technology has changed many things in ours. It has changed our lives. Technology, sometimes we don't even know how it works. We know that exists the Wi-Fi, but we have no idea how that works, but we take advantage of it. Uh, I will make a test of age in this group. How many of you remember what is a slide rule? Can you raise the hand, the ones who know what is a slide rule? Almost nobody here, just a few. One, how many? Only one here. Two, I see there. Okay, you know, the slide rule used to be the calculators that we had when we were university students. At that time, there were no computers, no internet, no uh, calculators. And of course, if you see that in a year, you know, a period of 40, 45 years, it is amazing to see that computers today can do processes that could be completely unimaginable, unimaginable a few years ago. At the same time, we live in a world which is increasingly turbulent complicated, polarized, in which unfortunately the level of tolerance of people to the perspectives of others are sort of becoming more and more um, uh, sort of uh, uh, complicated. And this turbulence in the world also matters a lot for us in higher education. Because what we are doing today is preparing the citizens of tomorrow. And if the citizens of tomorrow don't have that level, that capacity, to understand the otherness, to tolerate others, to uh, prevail dialogue against confrontation, of course, we know that it's going to be a much more complicated world. And in this, of course, demographic matters a lot. I'm sure that you know this, but it is very clear that, you know, the world is going to be changing, is going to be sort of shifting very differently. Pakistan is a very young country, but not all the countries are as Pakistan. There are countries in the world which are really struggling because youth is not there anymore. So certainly, that is going to have a significant impact in many shapes of society, including higher education. 
So look at this chart showing, you know, where the growth is going to be growing in future years. And of course, you see countries that are going to be decreasing their population, while there are countries and regions of the world, including Pakistan, in which there's going to be a significant growth in population. And this is good news. But of course, we need to make sure that youth will be properly, you know, properly empowered in order to really become you know, the better citizens that all of us are looking at. Look at this picture. This is a newspaper from 2016 in Italy. In this town in Italy, they were celebrating that for the first time in 28 years, a baby was born in the town. Is that the reality of Mexico or Pakistan? No. We have exactly a complete the opposite here. And of course, this demographic shift will have significant implications. Why? Well, because for instance, in the case of Europe, the population will continue decreasing. While for instance, right in front of Europe in Africa, there's gonna be a significant growth. And of course, you know, think about the fact that by the year 2030, about 40% of the total uh, youth globally is gonna be living in Africa. And in terms of disparity, currently more than 70% of youth in Africa live with less than $2 a day. And this is a reality that we see every single day in front of us. And we better take a look to that holistic perspective because otherwise all of us are gonna be in big, um, in big trouble. So, of course, the reality is that there is still a significant disparity in access to higher education. There has been significant improvements in terms of access. You know, uh, people in rural areas, women, uh, uh, people with less uh, socioeconomic status and socially disadvantaged people are having access to higher education, but not at the pace that it will be needed. Take a look to the case of uh, Pakistan in comparison to Senegal, but in comparison also to France. And of course, you can see still the significant disparity in access to higher education, which is preventing the opportunity for people to have a better life, because we know that higher education is about better life and is about better conditions of our communities. So no question that, considering the demographics, in years to come, there will be a brutal pressure for talent. And then still you might be thinking, oh my God, he's talking about everything but quality assurance. Yes, and that was intentional. Because I just wanted to make the case that unless we shift the sort of the perspectives of the way we address the challenges in higher education, and unless we do that in terms of quality assurance, we are gonna be thinking about measuring things that are not related to the realities of the world that we are gonna be having in front of us. So, there is no question about the fact that there will be a furious competition for talent in years to come. There is no question that we are gonna be living in a world that is gonna be increasingly diverse. And of course, all of that give us a unique opportunity to think about a renewed landscape for higher education. Um, think about the, the skills that are being demanded by economy and society. And if you think about them, sense-making, social intelligence, cross-cultural competencies, design mindset, all of those are skills that the reality is that, honestly, we don't teach in our colleges and universities. We ask the universities, and all the universities all over the world will tell us, yes, we are preparing the students with those skills. But when you ask how, the answer is, I don't know. It looks like we assume that students learn those skills by osmosis, by just sitting in front of the teachers and suddenly, magically, they will learn those things. My question is, can, do we, can do we do better in higher education? In more consciously preparing the students to those needs of the future? Or do we assume that students 
will continue learning those skills by osmosis. When I was working at the World Bank, we conducted a study trying to understand what employers were thinking about the graduates of the universities and what was, again, the comparison between the importance that skills have in comparison to the level of satisfaction that they have about the graduates of the universities. And again, look at those skills, integrity, reliability, flexibility, empathy, creativity. Do we teach that, that, do we teach that in the universities? Again, I don't think we do. What are we doing in our universities? Well, the reality is that it looks like we are still preparing our students to remember, to memorize, to learn what we as teachers consider that they should learn with no questions being asked and then proving that by something that is called a test in which we provide a grade and the students remember that and a day after, all of you were students, a day after they will forget most of that because they will have to start thinking about the next teacher with which they will need to learn something by remembering and then passing the test and forgetting about it. And for all of us who were students many years ago, let me ask you this question. How many, not subjects, but how many teachers do you remember in your life? And probably you will remember one or two or three. Most of them probably either the best teachers or the most terrible teachers. The, but the majority of them, we don't even remember who they are. We don't remember what they were teaching us. And probably we don't remember what we were supposed to be learning from them. So I think it looks like the realities of the world are a little bit different to the way that we dissect the knowledge in our higher education institutions. And certainly, we need to figure out a way to make more clear that the world is not as the way that we dissect the knowledge in our colleges and universities. And also, the way we teach. As Kostlin says, lectures are a wonderful way to teach, but a terrible way to learn. There should be other, more innovative ways that we can use in order to make the teaching learning process more engaging, exciting, interesting to the students. Otherwise, it looks like we are still stuck in the Middle Ages, like just teaching the way that we assume that it should be done. And then, of course, we had the pandemic. And on the pandemic, there was a significant wake-up call because beautiful buildings as this one we have here became completely useless. Nobody was around. So we had to learn to teach differently. And of course, there were some lessons learned out of this. We learned that, uh, you know, that uh, a, uh, there was enough, not enough planning in our higher education institutions to deal, to deal with the crisis. We also learned that, uh, you know, the operational environment of our institutions was much more fragile than we initially thought. We learned that online education was easier to implement but it was not a solution to the problems. Also, of course, the leadership of higher education was different to the leadership in a regular time, that many of the inadequacies of higher education became more explicit. And of course, we learned that uh, many of the, re the assumptions that we had about higher education and quality assurance were being challenged. So this idea of universities became completely different. And now we are living with a kind of the post-traumatic syndrome. We don't want to talk about that. It happened exactly four years ago when the lockdown happened in most of the world. And it looks like it was 50 years ago. We don't want to talk about Our, My assumption is that changes will happen in higher education. But then it looks like now we are assuming that this happened long time ago and we want to go back to business as usual in our colleges and universities. So my question is, do you think we live in a new reality or not? And if that is the case, 
Don't you think that we need to see that reality with new lenses, with new glasses? That we need to question many of the assumptions that we have about higher education. So there are significant challenges in our higher education systems in the world. And of course, we need to recognize them as a way to think about ways in which we can rethink our higher education. There is a significant bias towards universities as the only place where you can teach and learn good quality of education. There is, of course, we like it or not, still weak quality assurance in the world. There are clear disparities in access and many more of those in other cases. And of course, also there are significant opportunities that I think we can think about as we are envisioning about the future. What are those opportunities? Well, you know, I can think that we have a unique opportunity in more effectively contributing to an increasingly digital economy and society. We have an opportunity to deliver better and more inclusive education. We have a significant opportunity in more effectively responding to the growing demand, considering the shifting of the demographics of the world, of which Pakistan is not immune. We need to f a significant opportunity in striking more effective balance between public and private provision in higher education, in becoming global universities in an age of increased nationalism and isolationism. And of course, we have a unique opportunity in making of our universities more flexible, more adaptable learning organizations. And for that matter, believe it or not, finally, quality and quality assurance matters. Because if quality assurance is properly being placed, it becomes the source of innovation and disruption. If quality assurance is being seen from a very traditional standpoint, it becomes exactly the opposite. The deterrent of innovation for the sake of status quo, and consequently that is not resolving the matter. So that's why I was very pleased to see the new developments that are happening in Pakistan in supporting new ways to think about quality assurance. So, how our institutions can ensure that students are acquiring these new skills, but at the same time, how do we make of our institutions more flexible, but also with a greater culture of evidence? And that's where I believe quality assurance in a new perspective becomes significantly important. Let me ask you this question. Do we know how the students learn? Do we know if they student, they, they learn because of what we teach, despite of what we teach, or independently of what we teach? Many times, believe it or not, we don't know. We assume that the test is the way for us to demonstrate that they are learning. But I'm not quite sure. And also, I'm not quite sure if that they are doing that because of what we are transmitting to them. We have here some students, and I'm sure that they can tell us that they figured out other ways to learn that go beyond the traditional classroom experience. So, in summary, I think in our institutions we need to figure out how do we provide more equitable access opportunities for education? How do we do it in such a way that students stay? How do we make sure that relevant, continuous, and flexible education is provided to them? How do we assure that they finish their education on time? And of course, more important, I believe, how do we build a culture of evidence in our higher education institutions? And that is going to be the last part of my presentation, the need of a culture of evidence for which, again, quality assurance matters. Though, so quality assurance, I think it has made significant um, improvement all over the years. Um, however, still, we have in our systems some challenges. For instance, the accreditation syndrome I referred to. Everybody equates quality assurance with being accredited. And then the question is, are we preserving tradition and or we are fostering innovation? Do we have enough emphasis on assurance or in compliance? Is quality 
or accreditation an end or means towards something better. So I think all of us, we need to think about that as we are as talking about these kind of things. And of course, accreditation, it has significant values. It's a significant enabler of quality, a recognition of the value of higher education, fosters sane competition among higher education institutions, and of course, it should be and is a sense of uh, proud recognition, prestige, status, that matters as well. But I think we need to think about accreditation in terms of more accountability and more openness of our institutions. Interestingly, you know, when I was working at the World Bank, I remember that we used to conduct a survey among governments all over the world to see what was kind of the key issues that they were facing um, in, terms of, um, in terms of priorities for the government. And interestingly, quality assurance became among the top three priorities that governments all over the world had related to the key issues that higher education is facing. Nevertheless, as you know very well, many times when we talk about quality assurance, it looks like we tend to measure something different, and even sometimes something that is not as relevant as we might think about. And of course, we need to change that, uh, that uh, mindset. You know, think about this, accreditation. Is an act of compliance or is a means for enhancement of our educational institutions? Quality should be seen as a goal or as a means to a more relevance in our educational systems. Does the quality respond to relevance needs or not? We might have the institution with the highest quality, but the education that is providing is not truly relevant to the needs of a country or an economy. Do we know that? Sometimes we don't have the evidence for that. And of course, the tyranny of the rankings. All the institutions suffer that problem. We hate the rankings until we are in the rankings, and then we love the rankings. And if we were being dismissive of the rankings because they don't reflect the reality of our universities, as soon as we are in the rankings, we are the first ones forgetting about that and saying, now nah, we are ranked number 345, or one, or two, or all of that. So think about the future, and I will finish with that. I think um, if we think about a way forward, we need to recognize that you know, quality assurance is an evolving process. And we need to think about ways in which we uh, sort of go from a centrally controlled to a much more decentralized quality assurance. That's why, in the case of Pakistan, it was very important for the system to build quality cells among all the institutions, because that's the only way that we really can empower those things. But even inside the universities, we need to make sure that the quality cell is not being seen as that office that is closer to the office of the vice chancellor, that is isolated from the rest of the institution, or that is making bad decisions against all of us in our faculty areas. Again, I'm not talking about Pakistan. I'm talking about other countries. <laughs> So let's avoid the temptation to associate quality with selectivity. I'm very sad to see that many universities in the world, the way they say that they have good quality is because they say, I only accept 10% or 5% of the applicants. Is that true? A good sense of the quality. So being a good institution, not because the people that you educate, but because the people that you don't educate the people that you take out from your classroom. I don't think, I, I think it is even that unethical, I might say. The need for participatory approaches. Everybody should participate in quality. The need to connect quality with retention and with success, and also recognizing that it is not only about teaching or research, but it's about institutional behavior. I almost finished. I have 300 more, and then I will end. No, I'm sure that you are becoming nervous. I will promise that I will finish soon. So I will finish with a wish. And my wish is, of course, for our institutions to transition from quality assurance 
to quality enhancement. My wish is about moving from a compliance to a culture of institutional effectiveness. And last but not least, my wish is about transitioning from quality to relevance. Because I, quality matters, but it's more important to talk about relevance. Quality without relevance doesn't make any sense. And relevance needs quality, of course. Uh, you know, and that means precisely to transition from a very traditional to a transitional to a mature quality assurance system in which the emphasis, again, is not in compliance, but is in the enhancement of the process. And of course, that requires for you to assume a role as leaders in your institutions in the type of leadership that is the one that I think it is needed for the future. More action-oriented, sort of more visionary, but realistic, more ambitious, but humble at the same time. And of course, other elements more aspirational, by inspirational as well, and of course, leaders willing to take risks and to challenge the traditional assumptions. My question to you, is higher education just reacting, emulating, or is proactively engaged in fostering change? And what about accreditation and quality assurance? I think it is time to question some traditional assumptions in higher education. Is quality assurance up to the challenges of the future? Do students learn and we don't know how? Are rankings as important as we think? What at the end is education about? Is it about jobs or is it about society? How outdated are our academic programs in our higher education institutions? Those are some of the few questions that I hope all of us may be making in order to think about a better system of higher education. And of course, there is no magic formula. What in my work in Qatar might not work here, and vice versa. What in my work in a small institution might not work at a large institution. But of course, we need to be recognizing that the best experts on quality assurance are not the ones who come from outside, including myself, but you, the ones in our respective institutions. And of course, we can do many things, and we can do nothing or we can exercise the art of ambiguity, which is continuing doing the same, but expecting different results. The paradox is that our higher education institutions on in one way are the best laboratory of social change in our societies, but at the same time, they have the tendency to inhibit the uh, capacity of innovation for the sake of tradition, status quo, accreditation, quality compliance. Let's think about that differently. I just will finish with one quote from Paul Valeri. Almost a hundred years ago, he said, the future, like everything else, is no longer quite what it used to be. And I truly believe that in today's world, the future will no longer will be like it used to be but I'm very optimistic that all of you will be up to the challenges of the future, reimagining and redesigning a new higher education and also a new quality assurance. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Francisco. Our next keynote speech is risk-based approach in the role of accreditation, councils, and program accreditation. Presented by Dr. Bassam Al Hamad, Quality Coordinator at University of Bahrain. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I welcome everyone. I hope that uh, after four keynote speech speeches, uh, you're already concentrating, and hopefully you're not losing your 
uh, your way by, by lying down, because I was one of those who was lying down there. Uh, <laughs> uh, very interested speeches, and hopefully you can catch up with me. My topic, my topic is going to be about the Higher Education Council and the risks that encounter the higher education institutes. When I say risks, that means when you put a strategic plan on your way, you have risks on your way. A risk could be a rain that is really heavily raining. It could be the road that is not very well paved. And we are going to talk about how that risk that is on the way of the Higher Education Council or the Higher Education Institutes. And in this presentation, I'm going to cover five aspects. Those five aspects are going to be, going to be tackling the licensing, accreditation, and review. So what is the story about licensing? We are going to talk about it. About reputation, sometimes quality assurance supports reputation, and sometimes it pulls reputation of the university to the back. And that it could hurt the higher education reputation at the country, rather than developing that reputation. And that is one of the risks that could be considered, because we need to add to the reputation of Pakistan and not vice versa. And uh, I'm not going to go through some risks that are related to that. Number three is talking about operations, sustainability. We have private and public universities. Are our public universities financially stable or not? And if you think about it, one, with that mass education of big numbers, where Pro Professor Mukhtar, uh, the, the chairman, he was mentioning that, well, we are having more and more students, which is a, a, a sign of uh, some kind of a satisfaction and a, a sign of something that is really good about people learning. But are the public universities capable of handling all those numbers? Or they are pulling somehow the quality of that public university. Because me as a professor teaching 20, 30, or teaching 60 or 70 in a class, definitely the quality is not going to be the same. It's going to be different. And then I'm going to be covering areas like mass education risks. And that is also going to be part of the risk that we are going to be covering. Not to go really far, let's go into the depth of each one. So first we are going to talk about the accreditation and review. And one of the points that I found in many of the countries, they had been applying a lot of cycles of review for the university. They went to national accreditation, national reviews, international accreditation, national qualification frameworks, program reviews, international reviews, institutional reviews, ABIT, AACSB, and so on. When I mention all that, and the university is going to go through all those cycles of reviews, this is killing. And maybe at one time, they are going to feel that they are fed up of filling up papers. Especially that if they cannot see that they are putting their, really their foot on the next step of developing and can see the quality that it is really uh, getting into a better situation. So be careful as quality assurance sells, and I'm saying that for other higher education institutes, as well as the higher education council. If you have the national qualification framework, your institutional uh, program, uh, institutional reviews or program reviews, try to make it integrated into a way that it puts less work on the higher education institutions to make it a sustainable model for quality improvement and enhancement. Uh, number two is the conflict of interest. I'm not sure what's happening exactly in Pakistan, but one of the, the, the problems is that, is that the minister or the minister of education or the higher education commission, it puts the standards it trains all the universities or the higher education institution, institutions on those standards, and then it starts reviewing those higher education institutions. Now, when I review my kit, when I review the, the, my kids that I already raised, uh, it's difficult to say about my children that they are not good or they are bad. 
and there, here where, where the conflict of interest comes into being is that the minister or the responsible person for the higher education council or commission, if they are the ones who are, take, who are taking the responsibility of developing the quality of higher education institutions, for a moment they will think that, okay, I worked on the capacity building, but still my universities are not really developing. But I cannot show to the cabinet that I'm failing. I already did a good job, but the universities are not as fast as I was expecting. And this is where the, the risk comes that there could be a possible conflict there uh, internally with the management or the governing model, uh, the governance or the governing model, in which here we need to inter, uh, include or involve the international experts being part of the review process or part of the capacity building process where you have some kind of an interest that separates the interest of the higher education itself, the council, and the reviewers who are going to be reviewing. Number three is the bureaucracy and de delays. And I have seen this in many places. Again, I don't know what's happening in Pakistan, but I have seen this at least in the area that I'm living in, in the Gulf area, the Arabian Gulf. And the problem that we had is that the Higher Education Commission approves, should approve all the programs that are going to be deliver, delivered at the institution. So what happens? You want to deliver a new program. It will take one year at your institution. It will take another six months at the Higher Education Council. So one and a half year and two years for a new program, you're already very late. Everything had been developing. Everything changed. We are in a very turbulent uh, world. So we should be careful. That's one of the risks. We need to be really agile, very fast, and, and flexible as higher education institutions, the governing model, the governance, how it works, and as well as the higher education council. Incompetent reviewers. Uh, I had seen that one of the plans that had been presented by one of the keynote speakers is that they are uh, developing new program evaluators, PEVs, and uh, maybe they get the support of QA, and uh, as I have seen the presentation. This is good, and actually I really appreciate that effort. Uh, what I'm worried about is that if your reviewers are not as competent, this will reflect really negatively on the higher education institutions because people will not start, be, not start to believe in the quality standards. Why? Because they can see the quality standards, but when they apply them, they apply them on the, uh, uh, on the mindset of that person who is reviewing the program evaluator which is not well qualified or, or not competent. Uh, number five, which is the imma immature system. Immature system, what I mean is that we are having higher education moving. And there's one higher, uh, one higher education institute, one university. It's easier to say university than higher education institute. So I'll say university. So we have one university moving at the speed of 100, and another university moving at the speed of 80. And a third university moving at the speed of 50. Why? Because universities are different. They have different resources, different faculty members, different labs, and so on. So higher education council should expect that universities would move at a different speed, which means that the universities which are slower, they are not worse. They are not bad. It's just that they are just slower, and eventually they will be there is that they don't have enough capabilities. And in that sense, we should not hurt our higher education institutes. We should not hurt the university telling them that you're bad. But we're telling them that you're achieving and eventually you'll be there. I had seen in one of the examples in some of the uh, countries, they publish all those reports on media about all these universities, the good ones, and the ones that did not achieve or did not obtain the accreditation or the full confidence. And by that, they were hurting themselves as a country about the reputation of the higher education rather than helping the universities to develop. Going to the next point, because I have taken too much time in the first one, 
Uh, the reputation risks, I already touched on, upon it about the media idea. And uh, I, was just, I will just tell you an example that happened in Bahrain. We had, for a small country of 1.5 million, that is like a small city in Pakistan or uh, anywhere else. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like a village as well. That's, that's not a city even. Uh, and talking about reputation, uh, we had about 30,000 international students. For us, it was big for 1.5 million. Uh, and the number of students we have in higher education is about 150,000. Talking about 30,000, that is a big number, one over five, about 20% or so. This number from 30,000 dropped till about 3,000 only because we hurt it ourselves. I'm, I'm trying to be honest with you and be careful not to have this, this not to happen to any of the countries, including Pakistan. Why? Because we had two universities out of 15 universities which did not do well. And those two universities, they were put into public, into media, and there were reports everywhere. And KSA, Saudi Arabia, decided, oh, it looks like Bahrain is a bad country for higher education. Pull off all of your students. Kuwait decided, to pull all of the students. And we had Emirates, somehow they pulled the students and other universities. And you can imagine how did we hurt ourselves just because of that. And just to show the last sentence there, just to compare the government in Australia, along with Australian higher education quality and which is called TEXA simply, has created the Australian government an economic lever to raise the reputation of higher education by marketing it nationally, regionally, and internationally. So what I'm trying to say is that we did something similar in Bahrain is that Higher Education Commission is working hand in hand with the Chambers of Commerce. Myself, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I work in the Chamber of Commerce and I work at the university. I'm also as a cons consultant in the Quality Assurance Agency. What I'm trying to do here I'm trying to put all the, the all, uh, government powers, which includes the economic part or the quality assurance, which is the higher education council in this sense, to work together, economic with education, so that we can have something that is really reflective for our reputation. Number three, remember I said five, so I'm number three here. I'm half aware ago, but I will go faster. So number three, I already covered part of it, which is to talk about the operability, financial, and sustainable risks. So number one, which is part of it, is the strategy. I want to say something of what Francisco even mentioned. Uh, uh, do we have a strategy for the Higher Education Commission in Pakistan or not? Okay, and then, uh, does, uh, do the university uh, align their strateg strategic plan to national priorities in Pakistan or not. Why I'm saying this, it's not that I'm saying that you don't have. I know that you have a good efforts, but I'm try just trying to reflect from the research that I have done is that there are many countries in which they don't know exactly where they're going. They think that if they obtain the quality assurance confidence or accreditation uh, as a full mark and actually they are just uh, satisfying the minimum standard of quality there's a difference of satisfying minimum standards which is mentioned as a standard in the quality standards and be between a vision that really pulls you of something in future and that was my argument with many quality leaders is sometimes sometimes not all quality leaders they pull the university to the minimum, which is the standards, rather than pushing them to a vision of a national priority after five and 10 years. And we should be careful about that. And this is a point of compliance. Is it compliance or enhancement? And I think so, uh, Prof. Francisco, he already mentioned that very clearly. To mention the point about national and international accreditation, which one is better? Is it national or international? And we always have this argument. Why, why we can't say that to have a balance between national and international accreditation? Why? Because international gives you this international 
practice the international uh, latest trends within a field. Because when you take an international accreditation in engineering, it gives you the latest trends in that field. But national are also very important because international does not cover the national priority part, which is the visionary part. And that's why you always need this balance between national and international. The risk is that you depend only on one of them. There is one country uh, in this region, other than Pakistan, they accept international accreditation as sufficient that you don't need to do any national review. And that is a risk. That is a risk that they should be careful about. Uh, after that, business model, I, I want to insist about government universities should have a business model. Saudi universities, they have taken a decision few years back that all public universities should be financially self-sustainable. All universities, they started with three and they are increasing them to five and they are going to eventually cover all the universities. And coming back, will the public universities rely all on government uh, support, financial support? If they are going to continue that, they will suffer in future. Number four, number four, okay. So number four is the market mismatch. If there's a market mismatch, and I think so, the market mismatch is very clear. I have graduates that they are not fit to the market. And maybe my workshop was talking about how the intended learning outcomes of the course, if they are really reflecting what the student or the graduate should do in the market. And this is part of having a mismatch. And I think so this is a very clear point. I don't need to cover it in details. But I would like to cover that, that we need to know that there's a mismatch between number and quality of graduates. It's not only quality, the number. I'm going to clarify. I need 100 engineers in a certain area. What happens, the university takes 500, they graduate 300, and then we have 200 unemployable. What I'm trying to say is that we need to look at both the number and the quality of graduates, and that is part of a risk. It should be part of our strategic plan to look at the risks. Market need analysis, very clear. I need to know what is in the market, and carrier progression and pathways. Uh, I think so the career progression and pathways, I would like to mention the example of the career guide, which is uh, TAFE. TAFE is uh, an organization in Australia. And this is one of the examples that they have in which they have a very clear path for the students who's graduating from school and what he's going to be in one, two, three, four, five years, certificate one, certificate two in a certain area. Do we have these career progressions very clear for our students or not? If we do not have, that means we don't know what is the market. And we don't know what really exactly what we need in the market. And that is the problem that we always have, is that we have this kind of mismatch. This is not something to explain, but I kept it in my presentation for those who would like to go back. If you need a good career management, please go back to this slide. And I'm going to provide you with four different books. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a co-author in all of them. Uh, so uh, one of them is with UNESCO, another one was with Inkahi, a third and fourth one with Emerald and Springs, Springer, and, all, and, and it explains in details about the carry management. It also discusses to have this mismatch to be matched between what is in the market and our graduate through student empowerment. What do we mean by student empowerment? I had a discussion with the uh, with the LTO, right? Yeah, that's, I have discussion that he, he went through a kind of a program which is, which is like a dual uh, program in which they have uh, like two, two days, if I'm correct, that he goes to the university and another three days he goes to the work place. And imagine that within the same week, you are studying and applying what you are learning. And this is part of the student empowerment. And there are many different ways of doing it, and that, that is just one example in Netherlands. And what I'm trying to say is that there are risks if we don't have a match of our graduates. And one of those risks that you're going to have if you don't have student empowerment. One of the mass education risks, which is the final one that I have here, is that we have many students coming from, you know, schools, all of them they want to be BSc graduates, 
MEC graduates, PhD graduates, and actually we know the market needs is 30% about, if you go to research, we need them to be in a higher level, higher education, not vocational. The vocational, the technical field will take about 70%. If we do not organize this mass education well and really align them and streamline them to where to go, we are going to have a problem with mass education. In conclusion, the Higher Education Council should have a strategic risk-based approach. In what areas? In areas related to accreditation, reputation, market demand, and so forth. The regulatory body should put a balance between control and chaos. Chaos, that means it should not hurt itself by harming the reputation. Uh, there should be very clear policies, of course, I, I think that's clear. Mass education risks has negative impacts, which we need to consider that. The last slide, market analysis should be part of your business, higher education council, I mean. If you don't have a market analysis, don't rely on universities to do market analysis. They cannot do it. It's, it costs a lot. So there should be a national uh, idea about where is my market, what do we need exactly, and we need to have a vision about it. And of course, we need to have a very clear progression, and that reflects very clearly uh, in, in the example that I have presented uh, for NQF and the ECTS and so on. Eight, the uh, coordination, as Francisco has mentioned, and uh, he mentioned about the public and private universities. If they do not work with each other, the public universities are going to be suffering, which means that the private sector should work as a supporter and enabler with the pro public sector. They should need to work hand in hand together. Uh, lastly, these are the four books, if you want to uh, have a read about them, and, um, and, and hopefully uh, you can gain a lot. One of the topics was about balancing centralization and decentralization. It's in the publication of UNESCO, and uh, it helps a lot how the QECs, the example that you have, and how to even decentralize it inside the institution. I have explained that in details in one of my books. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bassam. For our next keynote speech, Greening Higher Education, What is the Role of Quality Assurance in Promoting Sustainability? Ms. Susanna Karkhanian, immediate former president of Inkahe, will be joining us online. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm really happy to be here with you. I hope you all see my screen in full format. If not, just let me know so that I could fix it and switch my screens because I have two separate screens here. So um, it's, it's my pleasure to, uh, um, to be addressing the honored audience here and to congratulate Penkahe on this uh, outstanding event that they have organized. I'm really very sorry I cannot be with you now, but I really, from my heart and soul, tried hard to be there, unfortunately, due to some you know, issues, um, technical issues, uh, that was not possible. But I'm, again, happy to be here with you and share with you some of my insights on, 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 the, on this very important topic that the conference is elaborating on, the future-proofing quality assurance in higher education. So indeed, what is there in the future for us, for quality assurance, for higher education? And when I was approached to pick up a them, I was like, there is nothing more important than what, where we are heading into. What is the atmosphere, what is the environment we're creating for ourselves as educationalists, as quality assurance, to make sure that the future is bright? And what is the role of quality assurance in making that future bright? So uh, maybe my presentation will, will, be, um, will have a tip for this. A slightly different angle, but still, I would love to ignite some discussion at the higher education community level, especially at your level, who are leaders in your institutions, leaders in the system, leaders coming from diverse countries, just to start thinking on where are we as higher education, as quality assurance community of higher education heading into. So let's just be honest. 
like at this point of time, how many of you are sitting here with a very deep insight in your heart regarding political tensions, military tensions, wars, destruction, natural disasters, societal issues? We all have that. We all are dealing with, you know, a lot of concerns, a lot of baggage that is behind this, you know, higher education agenda that is up in front of us. Behind this, there is a richness of things, of, of, of issues that we are, are actually dealing with and as higher education community are actually supposed to handle. But now let's see what is going on at this point. I would like to briefly, um, you know, um, come with the facts like um, in, in 2022, already in UNESCO report, 56 countries were in political and military tension. And now it's even more. So per, 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 per the data, about like 40% of countries globally, or 30 to 40%, they have some issues. So if this is the, the situation we are in, then what we are doing here as educationists, what is our role? We, we know that the issues of democracy are there. Democracy is not trying to, uh, to demonstrate what it's all about and actually help the, the um, or does it really exist in the ideal form we think of it? We have uh, increasing prevalence of authoritarian system, deeply rooted, rooted corruption in many systems. We have natural calamities. How about human interaction, pandemic, constant lies by falsification of history? Is it a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. Or it has all created throughout the years, and then there is an explosion every day here and there. Could it be the fact that as educationalists, we failed at some point in the history, and we weren't able to come up with a solution so that the, the, the past actions create the, the, the uh, so-called future for the past, which is now, and which is we are, which we are facing as you know the current challenges we're facing, and they're in, increasingly uh, multiplying in their effect. Current generations witnessing the impact where we are there. We witness the impact of what was done in the past, and now as educationists, we have to make sure that the generations to come do not put any blame on us, and they actually are um, grateful for the actions we are taking now. Um, yes, uh, the impact of education is long term, it's tangible one, and there is a lot of expectation there. Yet, let's go back and look at what do we have as higher education in the curriculum. What do we teach? Predominant theoretical teaching, less so application, disconnect from real life. But what is most important, when we look at the content of delivery and, you know, uh, the, the methodology is delivered, what is crucial is that the key elements that matter for humanity, like sustainable success, um, you know, academic, social, ecological, and humanistic matters, most of them are just uh, being covered superficially without deeply in rooting of what actually matters. So, well, um, but there is a lot of things going there. Like starting even 1992 already, um, UNESCO star, United Nations Framework for Convention on Climate Change. So this has been there already for um, more than uh, 30 years. And where we are now, how many countries can you now report that are actually embedding those actions in the education? Then there was Paris Agreement and then Action for Climate Empowerment in 2016 actually highlighted specifically what is the role of education what is the role of training and what is the role of public awareness in promoting greening higher education agenda on promoting sustainability? So I'm just like, taking this, all of these issues and trying to, to come up with what is the role of quality assurance in this agenda? What are we doing? Where are our standards? Are we as quality assurance providers actually triggering those thinking through our standards, through our procedures, so that the institutions and the communities could be supported from one perspective and also promoted in, um, in terms of those key aspects. Now, um, let's look at what is happening. Like, um, education and training is the key uh, to individuals' understanding of and responding to the effects of climate. 
impact and all, all the issues that are happening, the climate catastrophe, by providing them information, skills, values, and attitudes. It all comes from education and predominantly, of course, starts in K-12, to but higher education is where the deep knowledge happens. And so this is where we have to be embedding that, that in our uh, practices. UNESCO policies uh, call for transformation towards sustainable education. And there is an, a, a growing understanding that the universities, through the Paris um, Agreement, there was a concentration that the universities need to bear a, 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 a good share of responsibility in promoting this agenda. But again, you go back, and from our experience of evaluating systems, evaluating programs, evaluating institutions, we go back and there is really superficial coverage of all the issues that matters nowadays. There are some regional developments out there which are really good, but if you look deeper into, into the impact, well, they are just seeing a seeds to, to expect more. But again, let's discuss what is the role of quality assurance and how to make sure that the quality assurance actually incorporates all those issues and promote like the future proves the higher education through quality assurance, as the title of this conference goes. Let's look at what is happening um, at individual country level. A brief analysis of all country level policies have demonstrated really um, a picture which is, um, uh, is yet to improve. Who drives the Greening University agenda in the first place? In the first place, when we look at the uh, policies and all the, you know, at national level for higher education institutions, there is a clear lack of clear definition of what is green agenda for higher education. What is it that is on the table so that the quality insurance could be promoting it? Again and again, as in many aspects in quality insurance, you don't have the definition, then you can't measure it. So it's not measurable. If you cannot define, then, um, then you cannot develop the instruments that would measure it. So we find that at the systemic levels, predominantly um, the, that it's only covered through the soft regulations, conventions, UN conventions, they're pretty much having a very good coverage of what the expectations are. But let's look at what happens in, at the national level. I think sample analysis of some of the leading countries, it was only France that had a clear agenda for higher education on how to promote greening education. Again, at policy level in many countries, you would not see, uh, well, of course, there is a definition for greening, you know, economy, greening, sustainable economy. It's a lot of, um, uh, 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 you know, discussion is there. But when it comes to the specific role for higher education in this, yeah, th th this, there is a need um, for more development. We all know that majority of the systems are centralized and unless the government set the, set the clear agenda, the institutions would not be able to follow up on that. So at national level, we have really, um, there is a major gap at national level, at country level, on how to define in the first place this greening higher education. And once we define the greening higher education, then it will be easier to put the measurement mechanisms to link it to the quality assurance. When we look at the institutional level analysis, um, there, yes, a majority of the institutions, because there is no national level guidance or accreditor guidance, they would link directly to the sustainable develop, development goals, and they will do some actions here and there. But again, it's predominantly linked to their leadership style, the leadership initiatives. So it's not a systemic approach. The leader leaves, everything else changes. So to to make sure that there is a systemic approach to greening higher education and also developing the quality assurance to support it, we still need to make lots of efforts at the institutional level. Then um, we have clear challenges, yet the benefits outweigh the expectations. So when we look at the challenges in promoting greening higher education and quality assurance to support it, the coordination activities and strategic support from national policies, as we have mentioned, come on the forefront. Then strategic leadership at the institutions. Even if there is a policy, but the institutional uh, leadership level is not engaged, is not interested, nothing happens. So at the leadership level, there should be a very strong capacity building and promotion. And they, of course, uh, 
mechanisms at the national level should, should, level should be set to link, to trigger the thinking, the funding, and also supporting the, the institutions when they move on to the um, uh, development of the greening strategy and development of the core issues that supports it. Lack of faculty, lack of staff, lack of student engagement. I, uh, Jacob was talking about the student engagement. And also, um, Francisco, Francisco Marmaleo was talking about the, the role of politicians, what do we expect from them? So all these, you know, major contributions, they have a point. And putting all this together, we see that we are putting together the puzzles of a system and then seeing the gaps that, well, there is insufficient support coming from you know, the leadership level, the policy level, the stakeholder engagement level, and of course, um, industry and community at large engage, engaging those key, uh, key um, you know, stakeholders in, in the, the design of the um, a strategy for the higher education and implementation of greening higher education is, is actually um, the, the way forward and we need to concentrate on that. Well, there are very good uh, examples of universities, like in Finland, there are, uh, there is a, there are a couple of universities, and in Nordic countries, we, we could see like a strong development in um, establishing the greening uh, higher education. And there are benefits which those leaders are highlighting uh, in terms of the benefits of moving into the strategy of greening higher education and, and developing the measurement mechanisms to make sure that the um, higher education is benefiting and the students and the community and the economy is benefiting from that. Well, first of all, uh, when they were, uh, when they, those institutions were asked, uh, what was the benefit for you? First of all, reputation as leaders is growing at a paramount level. So you are already um, turning into the person who drives the changes, who actually becomes a change agent in this newly establishing system that and promoting the, the, the greening agenda. Improved quality of life on campus was mentioned as one of the key highlights. Like the students were all engaged and the faculty um, already engaging the community, also supporting them uh, to establish the campus life that is full of um, greening um, uh, you know, elements there. Stimulated research, yes, uh, the greening agenda stim stimulated research at higher education institutions. Um, there are real life opportunities for students. The students learn how to green the economy like within the university setting and then they take it with them to the industry that they're moving to. Um, enhanced awareness and change in behavior. The, the student behavior and faculty behavior started to change based on the uh, policies that were embedded in the in the, in the community, in the, in the university campus. Enhanced, uh, and then institutions um, uh, attract more students. There are, uh, there is, uh, with raising awareness uh, in terms of the greening education and the greening campus of higher education, you get um, more enrollment of the, at the student level. Students become more interested to come uh, part of this uh, noble community. Um, and of course, the economic benefits and, and, and of course, saving a lot of efficiency is coming out of this. In green university strategy is supported by sustainability principles and values guiding towards university green culture and beyond. So now we're talking about building the green culture and we also are talking about the culture of quality. So how to link them both together? And indeed, for that, we have uh, solutions that come from um, uh, Iguahi. Like, uh, I know you all have heard and have uh, had the chance to, to get to know the International Network of Quality Assurance in Higher Education, Iguahi, and our CEO, who is now with you, Fabri Senar. And um, you had very fruitful workshops with him. And um, of course, Iguahi, uh, already based on all those analyses, we came up with clear guidance of international standards and guidelines on how to promote transformative power of higher education. And those standards and guidelines that we developed for tertiary education institutions are actually taking the institutions through diverse maturity levels and promoting quality assurance systems and higher education systems through the uh, standards that we have embedded so different stages of development uh, growing from the efficient performance, relevance, and then 
moving on to the transport transformative power. You would see in the standards that we are um, pushing and uh, we, are, we are promoting out there, you would see um, a very detailed rubrics about um, uh, how to promote transformative power, for example, of an institution in terms of functions, in terms of operations, in terms of financial performance. Looking at the financial performance of an institution and looking at the health of the institution is the key. Financial health is the key. And also analyzing the contributions towards the, you know, the, the trends in efficiency, trends in greening, um, you know, education that we are providing. This is something that is this tool is allowing you to do, to do the in-depth analysis and understand how, how your systems are moving. And more broadly, those standards that we are providing, they are also coming up with the systemic, and uh, you know, systemic benefits. We are looking at how, for example, quality assurance bodies, whether this is internal quality assurance or external quality assurance, how they are actually having a systemic impact at the at the, at the institutional level, at the country level, and the community they are serving to. So uh, I will, I, I invite you all to go through this. Um, uh, standards and guidelines and try to start linking um, the, the, the standards to your institutional performance and also designing the systems that enable promoting your, um, you know, strategies. Um, well, in many systems that we go to evaluate, you know what the major problem is? You would look at the strategic priorities of the institution, you would look at the funding uh, budget, and then you look at the annual reports, Believe me, absolutely no link. Which means that internal quality assurance, while it is there, it's predominantly there for only compliance purpose, for only reporting for accreditation purpose. We have to revisit this. And internal quality assurance needs to serve the mission, the strategies of the institution. It needs to ensure that you are driving data-driven governance that you are having data-driven governance to support your decision making. So there are a lot of things that um, these standards are actually providing for, for um, uh, so that you could build the system that is linked to actual your needs in the system to improve. And of course, um, paramount as under the umbrella of this um, conference, how what to do? Let's think together. Let's now stop and think together. What do we do? to future-proof higher education. What do we do for quality, with quality assurance now to future-proof higher education in the future so that the generations that come after us, they don't put blame on us, rather they thank us for it. Thanks a lot, and I wish lots of success with this very beautiful event that you are doing there. Thank you. So our next representative is Dr. Salva Stop, Associate Professor and Quality Coordinator, Bandirma Oyendi Oyul University. Uh, intending learning outcome and its element learning outcome based on assessments. Please welcome him to the stage. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hello all. And I am the only one between your lunch, right? <laughs> Oh, you still, I, I, we still have one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought I was the last one. <laughs> All right. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about the um, outcome-based assessment in education in uh, perspectives. Yesterday, uh, in the workshop, we actually went through from mission vision statement all the way through to uh, classroom and how we can actually enhance our classroom teaching via our syllabi and how to create a syllabi week by week and then how to tie it to our learning outcomes in the institutional level and uh, faculty level and the uh, um, program level. And then how actually we're gonna assess individually each of those weeks. And uh, at the end of my workshop, I asked the participants, I don't know if they are here, how many of you were in my session? Great. And I gave them a piece of paper and I asked them two questions. I said, could you please tell me what you learned today, what was your aha moment, 
and what is that that I can improve so that I can, I can actually do the Deming's uh, circle myself. And I did read them, and they, they asked, are you going to read these? And I said, yes, I will read them. I did read them, and thank you very much for your great comments. And um, two things came out of it, and one of them, many of you said we were not aware of the AOL, IOLs and also the SMART model, and I'm glad that I was able to contribute in that level. And um, bad reviews were that my slides were in small in ponds and they couldn't read them, and next time I will definitely improve them. And I hope this time it's not. Um, and the second one was the time was short and they wanted to do a little bit more hands-on in a less crowded environment because I wasn't able to touch them individually. So I hope that I will be coming the fifth time, I think, uh, next time. And I will ask Ms. Asya to, or Dr. Asya now, recently, <laughs> uh, to Im increase my hours and then diminish my people attendance so we can actually do more hands-on learning. So um, to come to that, today I wanted to share with you, and then, oh, sorry, one other thing that was commonly asked was that, uh, my talk was a little higher level for certain people, and they said, is there any way that we can educate ourselves? And I, how I started myself into accreditation is this book, and it's like a very good book to read. So if you want to um, take it, a picture of it, and if you start reading of it, it gives you a very detailed, very good information. So my talk is today going to be about a research that I have done uh, in Turkey, and I did compare the study of Turkish universities, all 73 of them, with the top 20 universities in, in the world and also uh, G20 universities. And I looked at their mission and vision statements and see how they differ within the Turkey, around the world, and with the G20 universities. And we all know what is a mission vision statement. Mission is telling us what, what we are doing today and vision is what we want to be in the future. So I did some of these statistics that you can see uh, what are some of the countries that I have studied. And uh, when I looked at them, uh, the common concepts came in as uh, international, so um, I think that many of our uh, previous speakers were saying that, you know, we are getting more global and we are more interconnected. And that reflects in our mission statements in G20 and top 20 and all Turkey universities, they're all focused on internationalization and research, scientific, and so forth. I, I hope you can read. Can you read? Is it ponds are still too small? Okay. And um, some of them had only mission statements, and some of the universities that I looked had only vision statements. So not all the universities had mission and vision statements. And I did the research with Mac, uh, Max Max CUDA programming, by the way. And um, in Turkey, we have a different words for mission statements and or vision statements. And when I looked at their uh, portfolio, they were using different words instead of mission and vision statements. And these are some of the words that they are using. So even in that level, there was no coherency within the language itself. And you can see those are the, the schools in, the Tur in Turkey that um, they have only mission or vision or both at the same time. And some of the concepts that came up was um, ethical values was the highlight of the, the statement. Ethical values were noted all 73 countries. Now to note that, 
that was only there because our accreditation body is doing a specific search on this topic. When they are doing a evaluation, they're asking three topics specifically. One of them is do, what do you do for your students for their career development? So many universities has the career development centers now. The other one is how do you educate your students to be more um, socially awareness? In that sense, we added more courses to our curriculum for the social entrepreneurship, for example, or social uh, activities courses. And the third one is the ethics and value. And ethics and value actually made it to our vision and mission statements now. And we incorporate those into our classrooms. I can, ah, huh, okay. And uh, scientifically was another word that was commonly used and we assume that all universities are scientifically you know involved so this is not very creative way of saying because we supposed to be that we are the universities and the other one is cultivating is the word it was mentioned in the 65 uh, universities within turkey and instructional values or education was another word that was used in the mission. Again, that's not a brainer, right? Um, we are supposed to educate, so. Um, devotion to Atatürk, which is our biggest value, was mentioned. Uh, not that commonly, it, to my surprise. Not all the universities mentioned it, but certain universities definitely did. Peace and prosperity and accessible university. Now the accessible university was mentioned within pretty much 55% um, of the universities. And um, when you deep down look at what that means, you know, uh, the accessible university, recently after uh, COVID-19, is it 19, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we are in the, the 25 now, I don't know. <laughs> so um, we were all online education, but as soon as the COVID ends, it, it became a little bit less. And now recently, they're not allowing any online education. So it's immediately going back to um, the normal education and the face-to-face -face education. But it's accessible also means that, you know, it's open to everyone. Yeah, the doors are open, but when you look at some of the campuses, you don't see accessibility to some disadvantaged groups. And that's where there is a push from, again, our Higher Education Council to make it more accessible. So these, this is the statistical data for um, what vocabulary was used in, in what level. And you can see that um, the research was number one and eth ethic become the number two and it goes so forth. Now in Turkey, we have the, the government universities and the foundation universities. They are um, they're tied to higher education institutions, but they by law. However, they have different uh, way of looking at the education. So the foundation universities has a little bit more flexibility in that sense. Again, they were also very involved in international and scientific. So these were the key words that they have used in their visions and mission statements as well, or mission statements mostly. Knowledge, creativity, these are also uh, commonly used. Sports, to my surprise, came up quite a bit. And I believe that um, because they are in high competition, they're using the sports as attracting more students. Sports means more uh, facilities than anything else, actually. And these are the commonly used vocabulary again. And you can see that um, when we come to foundation universities, they became more focused on the 
um, internet internationalization and this, the research became the second. Now the, the universities are opening left and right in Turkey, especially foundation universities. And because of that, they're in high competitive environment. So they are really focusing on international. When you look at foundation universities, probably 60 to 70% of their students are coming from overseas now. And these are commonly used words again. And um, quality started to come up again in foundation universities, which they were not in the uh, governmental universities. When we look at the same concepts in the uh, top 20 universities, the number one is research. Number two is, um, actually the number two is that they don't have any mission statements in their websites. <laughs> And the uh, number three is education. So they're aligning themselves in that level. And number three is the internationalization, or four now. When we look at the G20 countries, they do focus on global and um, other concepts like services in the world and the community and the country. So they focus on more services, public service, service, providing the community. These are the commonly these are commonly used words in their mission statements. And um, what else they have? Quality also is mentioned in their mission statements. And this is the highlights of their commonly used vocabulary again. Um, parallel to the top 20 universities, they have uh, research and um, education, and then again, they do not have, uh, many of them don't have mission statements in their websites. Again, um, now when we look at the vision statements, uh, the state universities uses the respected, recognized, ref preferred university commonly in their uh, vision statements. So they are looking at the future from more quality base. You can see because they are respected, recognized. These are hands in hand uh, words that comes with quality. So they're putting the quality in the future in their future um, developments. Knowledge, research, universal, and successful orientations are the other ones. When we come to foundation universities, education and training is their commonly used vocabulary for their vision, and they started to put ethics in, um, in their visions as well. And continuous improvement or continuing the societal, regional, and worldwide um, development is also in their vision statements now. When we look at the top, 10 top 20 universities, uh, it doesn't change. Education is still there, leadership is there, um, innovativeness comes in, and uh, contributing to society region. So their vision statement parallels actually to their mission statements. Top 10 universe, uh, top 20 universities, when we look at the top uh, G20 universities, I'm sorry, G G20 universities, leadership, pioneer, pioneership, uh, concept of quality, concept of diversity, and diplomacy, um, these are the, the words that comes quite often. When we look at all the universities, synergy, health, environment, um, environment to problems, these kind of things are actually neither in their mission statements or in their um, vision statements. So um, this is the chart that I have done for the comparison of each word and how many times they have been repeated in state, foundation, G20, and top 20 universities. And there are some common ones, and there are some that's none or very few of those words. And again, 
uh, top 20 universities as well. I'm gonna pass these because if you want to, you can evaluate them later. And I have a feeling that you can't really read them anyway, right? It's too, the punt is pretty small. Yeah, that's right. So I just wanna to come to the result of the research that um, transformation from the, the teaching centering universities to research centering universities, they transform um, from like the teaching to research, and now they, when we look at their vision statements, it's more of a service-oriented, so it's kind of parallel to the, the development in, within the world, that the education actually is going toward uh, a service-oriented, so it's more like an applied science-oriented. So role of the, the, the modern universities is um, the foundation includes the education, research, and service for the societal benefits, and uh, globalization, universalized institutions with emphasis on transformation are the new role models for the universities. So the strategy and the vision mission, when we all put together, it's actually, we all know that the mission and vision is also, and you know, objectives and goals comes as well. But um, these are telling us the directions of our universities. And um, it all needs to be coming from the uh, external stakeholders and um, internally from our students, faculty members, and all that. When I ask the question to the universities uh, that um, how did you come up with your vision and mission, um, many of them said that they just you know, come together as the group of some um, strategy builders and they came up with, the, with their mission and vision statements. And they have been there pretty much like from the beginning of it, so they didn't change it much. So when you look at it, those mission and vision statements are done by a group of people without an input from any of the stakeholders, internally or externally. Another problem I have seen, another research I have done was that asking, um, within my university this time, I ask instructors and the people who are working in different levels, uh, to tell me what our mission statement is and what our, is our vision statement, and they couldn't tell me. And they had vague ideas or they didn't know if we had one. So that's a biggest problem because what we are trying to do here is um, we are actually trying to align our mission and vision, which is the goal of our universities to go forward or know what we are trying to do. But if our instructors and people who are working within the university don't know what that means, how can we align our classroom work and how can we align our own classes in those um, according to that mission and according to that vision? So when I asked that question to instructors, they were, a uh, majority of them were giving me an answer of like, you know, I know what I'm teaching and that's what I need to do. But that's different than what we are trying to guide our students toward. It's the industry that we are gonna have them. Our goal is not to graduate. We, our goal is not the number. Our goal is the quality, not the quantity. So we may be graduating maybe 90% of our students but only 10% of it is getting the jobs they, they need or getting the jobs within the field that they are educated, that's not a success. Yeah, we are maybe not graduating 90, 95%, but the important part of it is that we are giving them the quality and the tools that they need. So if we don't tie our mission and vision statements to our classrooms and make all that alignment, which in the workshop we have done it as a, a little bit of work all together, then all, for all of our intended learning outcomes needs to be very clear and tied to the classrooms, then our students can actually move to the area that we want them to go and the industry will utilize them.
So this is the results that we have done. How many of you know your institution's mission and vision statement by heart? If I ask you to tell me, will, would you be able to tell me? There is one person and then other one right there. So yeah, you can you can start. That's the mission or the vision? That's the mission. Anybody else? So your job from now on probably is to memorize your mission and vision statements and probably do more of the goals so that we can tie our work to that mission and vision statement. So the next level is I recommend that importance of the realistic goal settings during the vision and mission vision uh, creation because if we are not realistic about it then we cannot reach that goal and we need to compare ourselves with the other universities and especially the top universities to see how they are doing it and then improve our own mission and vision statements emphasize the core values according to the global trends and um, we need to do more discussions on that and um, we need to discuss what our missions and visions supposed to be and how we need to re develop them and revise, revise it and also make sure that the secondary education like K-12 education also understands the value of these universities and they can see them clearly so they can guide their students to our universities. The other thing that I want to say, and I'm making it very short because I know that the previous uh, talks were very valuable and they had had a very extensive uh, research and they had a lot of time, and I don't want to take too much time from your lunch hour, but during the lunch we can discuss this if you want to talk more about what I have found. But my next topic is going to be the uh, look at the academic instructors and I call it the Academic Instructors 5.0, and who are we and what we are and what we are gonna be and what do you think your job title will be in the future? Thank you very much, and if you wanna contact me, this is my email address. Thank you very much, Dr. Selva. Now, I would like to invite Jacob Grodeski, Policy and Project Manager, E-U-R-A-S-H-E. -E. He will discuss future of quality assurance, navigating challenges and opportunities, European, uh, European frameworks and its future. Please welcome Mr. Jacob. Thank you so much. I hope that works. The slides are working as well. So uh, I'm actually in the most dangerous position here between you and the lunch here. So uh, I'm going to be quick uh, and, and, and not perhaps use the full 20 minutes. And also we had enormous speakers and the content before uh, and so many of conclusions and the aspect were highlighted. So I will try to focus on the puzzles that we're missing, right? Uh, because that's what we all exactly want to do here to complement the whole framework that we are having uh, regarding quality assurance. So my name is Jakub Grodetsky. I'm a policy product manager at Eurasia, which is European Association for uh, Institutions in Higher Education in Brussels. We are representing mostly applied science universities and colleges, professionally oriented in Europe. Uh, and we are partnering with the European institutions uh, regarding higher education policy development and as one of the stakeholder organizations um, in the field. So, just very quickly with the plan, I will just shortly try to uh, put you the current scene of the European quality assurance system, the Bologna process and the tools that are developed. We are we are operating not in the revolutionary uh, times, let's say. We are more evolutionary when it comes to quality assurance development. But also we have a very diverse landscape. And I think uh, there is one distinguished thing uh, where it comes to 
um, when it comes to the quality assurance in Europe, that it started to be more connected and standards based to facilitate the needs of the Bologna process. I will speak that in a second. Secondly, we'll go with the students' uh, involvement in higher education governance and the QA processes very shortly again, but I think that's the main, main missing puzzle, although it was very good to see um, the students' involvement uh, in the strategy of the PSGs uh, later on, but how it's going to be done, it's another book, another chapter to uh, discover, I think. So we will be happy to um, help perhaps in that uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, and the thirdly, the, just the summary of the challenges, because many challenges of the QA were mentioned uh, by the other speakers, so I will not be anyhow innovative uh, in bringing the challenges for the future of quality assurance here. Um, you, will, you know the challenges. There were global challenges coming from uh, UNESCO overview. Uh, there were more alighted on the green um, strategies, but also very institutional based and based on the very local uh, reality of our community. So that's quickly a slide about Eurasia, a bit of advertisement here. If you are interested in the activity of our organization, just uh, link down to the webpage of Eurasia. If you are Applied Science University, uh, we are more than welcome to, 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 to um, welcome you in our network um, so we can contact later. So starting from the Bologna process, yeah, as you might know, the Bologna process was a game changer in the European reality. Uh, it started in 99. Um, it was a moment when the European ministers came to a conclusion that something is necessary to unify all these 40 plus systems because the main goal was to facilitate the seamless mobility between the countries. So actually the starting point for many tools, for many supporting tools for, for this exchange uh, was basing on the needs of the seamless mobility. So if we are talking about the quality assurance just in the national context, we might not see the full picture. We might more uh, link it also to the comparable and the trust required to move on with our degrees, to move on with our learning outcomes from one country to another, and also facilitating the mobility to come back to our country, but to not put the students in a situation that the learning outcomes in country B would not be recognized from country A after come back, for example. That's just simple, simple there. So over the years, uh, and here is the breakdown of the years, basically, the ministers were meeting every three, four years, and at agreeing on the new components being added to the framework. Yeah? I will not go into very details what was agreed when, just for your imagination, it has been started as a concept and then more and more puzzles have been added. You may have been hearing about, of course, European standards of guidelines of quality assurance, but the qualification frameworks um, as well in, was involved in these uh, processes, was brought up, the recognition process, processes, the, the whole paradigm of student-centered learning was also brought up politically as a, as a, as a, to the stage in 2010. Yeah? So, so more of this were being developed. Currently, we are not, there will be no more tools at this ministerial conference coming up in, in Tirana in 2024 in May. Um, it's more about monitoring and implementation, which is also challenging because if you want to have uh, the same tools or comparable tools being implemented by 47 countries this time, um, because of the actually um, Russia and um, Belarus being suspended in the rights of the Bologna process due to the breach of values of, of the process, of course, um, we, are, we are speaking about the 47 countries comparison. But the execution and implementation of it by the ministers is not so easy because this is a voluntary process. There is no obligation to actually fulfill the needs. However, it's a catch from the other side that if you are not fulfilling the standards and implementing the tools, your country and your students in particular might not have the same opportunities um, than the country you are, um, you are actually, uh, from, from your country, yeah? to, to your neighbors, to the countries around. So this is uh, not an incentive, but rather a push towards, uh, towards implementation. Okay, I'm trying to put the next slide in, yeah. And uh, what about quality assurance? Uh, of course, we are focus, gonna, gonna focus on only particularly this. It's a European standards and guidelines. They have been existing from 2005. 
What is also interesting about this framework, it didn't came from top down, from the ministry, ministry level uh, um, towards the institutions. It has been very much stakeholder grounded in, in, in initiative. Yeah? So Russia, my organization, was also one of the uh, organizations being a uh, motive for, for that change. Of course, not with me in that organization. I was in a primary school when it happens. Uh, however, however, we are talking about the stakeholder organizations. The other ones were European Students Union, the European Network for Quality Assurance, and the European University Association, and some other consultative members of the Bologna process. Um, so that's, um, that's, a, that's, that's a starting th thought for the couple of next slides, that the stakeholder-oriented action coming from the stakeholders, actually, motivations coming from the bottom up, is something defining um, uh, many solutions that in, that in the landscape afterwards exists. You know? So just focus a bit about stakeholders' involvement and as a basis of functioning of the QA system. That's what I, what I meant. Recently, uh, we conducted a project with a couple of other organizations, exactly the same ones who were proposing the, the first and the revision in 2005 and 2015. Uh, because we wanted to ask the same stakeholders what has changed. Yeah? We had COVID, we had different situations, we had growth of the digital means, we have new um, challenges in higher education. So we wanted to really uh, understand what are the new needs, because also the time for the potential revision has come. Yeah? And most likely we will be mandated to do that again. Uh, so we prepared the project to do this mapping, uh, and we tried to do so, and I will just share with you a couple of things, but if you want to learn more, um, that's definitely worth to, to read the whole publication. So for example, we've asked, let's say as an example, QA agencies, what kind of a stakeholder involvement exists uh, there? Uh, and I'm, sl I'm changing the slide here, but not uh, on the pilot over here. S but trying. Okay. Yeah, so we, we try, to, uh, try to understand who is really the, the, um, involved in the external quality assurance processes and activities, and the students, teaching staff, employers, other staff were at the top. Rest of the, for example, professional bodies, trade unions, student unions, alumni, and so on, were a bit lower, but still heavily involved. We are talking here about the external quality assurance. And just for you to know a step back, the ESGs are consisting of internal quality assurance, external one, and the agency level, quite similarly for a concept that uh, might be developed um, over here as well. Um, also, what is necessary, I think, to mention that wasn't mentioned uh, often, the external quality assurance is supposed to just check the, um, the feedback loops and the system where the system in the institution exists. So it's not to, it's not to use the misconception and check the same thing twice, but rather check whether institution has the mechanism to check something inside the institution. So not to avoid the double, uh, double checking, just, just the notion that I remember from some misconception I heard uh, recently. When it comes to the QA Fit project and the internal quality assurance, we asked what areas European-wide are covered by the internal quality assurance. And uh, again, the top one, actually the top notion by heavily, involved, heavily uh, covered and covered to some extent was together more than 97%, which was participation of students in staff and staff in higher education governance. You know? So again, the, the deliberating on the standards regarding students' involvement, that's very much uh, a, a, a direction to go to actually uh, keep it as a systemic involvement of students in quality assurance. And of course, the road and path to this, achieving this, is, is, is quite bumpy. And it's depending on the very big, big factors, also regarding the existence of the student uh, movements, the existence of the student's uh, engagement and understanding of students as a partner with its agency and not as a reception just for, um, just for the uh, just for uh, for the feedback gathering, yeah. But this is uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite long road there. Uh, what about the statements on external quality assurance, for example? The most prominent ones is that external quality assurance encourages the development of a quality culture in education. The main purpose is enhancement. That's also quite extraordinary here. How. Um, uh, already developed quality assurance countries because also within the education, uh, higher education area, we have a different notions of it. But most of the countries that, for example, are 
um, according to the standards for already four food cycles of, uh, of, of, um, of assessment, they're, they're switching towards enhancement in, in quality assurance. Yeah? So it's accountability is there to check, but there is a full autonomy given to the institutions um, from the national level. So the enhancement is actually the most common and, and desired value from the higher education, uh, from the QA agencies. And then goes ac accountability and the data sourcing and, uh, and internationalization of higher education. And coming back to the stakeholders' involvement notion, let's go here. It is important to notice that the degree of the stakeholders' involvement in quality assurance also varies and it's not linear. Yeah? So just not involved, just the involvement is not enough if we are involving somebody as a feedback uh, gatherers or we are having them in a committee. It's not everything what we are trying to achieve. There are different stages of involvement, right? We can start from the absence of any structural involvement in, uh, of stakeholders. We can think of an ad hoc individual stakeholder approach because of the external obligation again. So you can imagine the situation that the institution is establishing some committee just because this is the requirement, but what happens from evaluation to evaluation is not necessarily something um, meaningful to the development of the quality. Then we are going to the more advancement um, strategy and structural stakeholder involvement based on trust, to the co-creation involvement, which uh, allows every actor concerned in the system to put on the solutions, to propose the changes, and to make those changes being heard of and act upon with the same importance, regardless of who is proposing them. But that requires very strong co-ownership and co-responsibility of the institutions that we are operating in. So that's as a principle. And just that you can convey exactly the same when it comes to the students' representation and engagement that also has its levels of, um, of, of principles. So student representation principles are um, based on the fact that students are a core a stakeholder of higher education systems. It is necessary to preserve the independent representation of students. It also has to work in the interest of the constituency. By that, we mean all the constituencies, so we cannot uh, have a shattered constituency in the sense that the, the, the student rights would be breached because of the beliefs of the different groups. We are talking about the preserving the rights of the whole student society. Protection of that rights, maintaining co-ownership of the education systems, and the focus on quality ed education. In the long term, the higher education institutions are perceived to be the best place. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot I have to click a couple of times in this slide. Uh, so this is appearing what I just said. But at the end, it's also mm, to, to worth to, to notice that the higher education uh, institutions are the best place to actually foster the democratical participation and foster those skills potentially in the, in the future development of the, of, the high, of the system, not only higher education one, but country-wise. Um, and similarly to the stakeholders' uh, involvement in quality assurance that I was showing before, there is the same stairs of participation here uh, when it comes to students' involvement, starting from students as a decoration to the equal partners in the decision-making process. The breakdown you, you might find later in the presentation, not going further into that. But also, it's easy to define some barriers that might be a hint for you when it comes to this involvement. Trying to change the slide, sorry. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, it's an information issue, so there is lack of information about the quality assurance and possibilities for students. You know, so by, for example, yeah, just 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 giving it an example, what could be checked externally within the standards? Uh, it could be just if the institution has a strategy of communicating the quality assurance results and communicated the communicating the strategy and existence for students. You know? we, are, we are talking about the lack of information, and we cannot, as a, for example, higher education managers, be just receptive and waiting for this engagement to happen. And we cannot also ask to happen at top down. We have to really corroborate and find the gaps, whether something is working or not, um, in this environment. 
participation and quality assurance may not be also facilitated or recognized. Yeah? It's worth to think of whether there is a strategy for those who are really involved in the enhancement of quality on the level of institutions and whether there are, for example, means um, uh, such as individual learning paths or ability to skip some lectures in sake of uh, helping out the faculty because that's usually voluntary work. Of course, that's the better sen best scenario if there are some grants and supporting this work because we all want to avoid the unpaid work in general. However, the situation might differ. Also, it's different culturally in, in European higher education area coming from England with quite um, a long tradition of paying for work uh, and uh, even the students who are uh, heads of, for example, faculties in the UK cannot be actual students. They have to take a sabbatical leave because it's a full-time job to be a student's president. That's, uh, that, that might be interesting fact. On the other hand, it's full voluntary on the other parts of Europe. Okay. And just ending out of this with some thoughts on the lunch. It's just there. We're going we're gonna to have it in a second. The challenges for the future of QA, just two slides. Uh, and those are challenges that I really thought uh, about uh, while preparing this, but also while listening to, to others. Because I was fine-tuning this one while listening, knowing that I'm the last, so to not uh, avoid the repetition. Uh, we are talking about the preserving the notion of common ownership and responsibility for higher education systems. I think that's quite blurry and nice, wordy uh, challenge, but we have to understand that higher education institutions that are existing in our systems now might not be existence in such a way eternally, especially in the times like this. We are in the times where big platforms offering online courses are having a billions of, 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 of attendees. The micro-credentials waves and short learning opportunities are on the go. And the old type of university which exists for hundreds of years might not be exist for another same hundreds of years because of the rapidness as we are word, um, going on. So that's uh, preserving this notion of common ownership by the society, by the youth, by the teachers, by the uh, learning environment around, it's necessary. Demand for the internationalization of higher education versus national regulations. Uh, that's also the challenge here because uh, in some countries there is a big ambition to go with the internationalization notion to send and, uh, and rece or receive many more uh, students, but there might be national regulations uh, stopping this. And often those regulations are coming from quality assurance. That's a challenge that are, is existing in the European uh, higher education area, especially now, when there is a big push towards joint offer of degrees or the joint alliances of education, they want to do a joint programs together, but the, every national system requires something different. So you can imagine some, somebody uh, in the faculty trying to found up the program and being very lucky in trying to find the five different education systems and overcome all five barriers. Um, the different needs of learners and societies and the needs for reskilling and upskilling the society. So there is a clear notion here between the kind of uh, comfortable reality of, a, let's say, three, five years full programs versus the quick need for reskilling and what is really necessary to uh, equip people with the means to participate in society, especially from the diverse background with uh, sometimes with the, uh, with the worst start uh, in here. So it's necessary to understand this notion that we have to answer those needs not in the same way, because ultimately we also want to to broaden access to higher education to our societies and not go with the notion of, uh, of elitism as it used to be uh, still a couple of decades uh, ago and sometimes still now. One of the challenges is also use of, of course, artificial intelligence in education and assessment, which can go both ways. I will not go further into this. There was a couple of workshops and keynotes on this uh, topic as well. What is also important, the growing political infer uh, inference in higher education systems, undermining the role of the institutional autonomy and students' involvement and freedoms. Um, that's, of course, a big challenge in many, uh, in many, uh, many parts, many systems. And also, what, what is also important to notion here, one achieved institutional autonomy, it's not taken for granted that it will preserve. You know, we're also seeing the, 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 the breakdown of these indicators in a couple of countries around the world. So it's not achieved for granted. Growing role of the non-educational providers of education of courses, I was saying about the big platforms and also non-educational offerers. If we are talking about the systems allowing for non-educational uh, providers, we also have to think how quality assurance in our country have to answer it. 
uh, I'm sure you are know you, you know a couple of examples of the fraudulent activities when it comes to the either offering the diplomas and so on. I don't uh, need to bring it bring it on, but of course that's uh, that's that's one of the role of a quality assurance to offer the potential learners the uh, valid experience of learning to not be cheated actually regarding what those students paid for, had been enrolled for, and so on and so on. So it's a big, uh, big work here uh, to do for the systems and for QA agencies. And the future-proof measures. So preserving the notion of common ownership, again, it's a, it's a nice word, but I think this is a core, really, of, of what we are here all about and having all the stakeholders on board. Involvement of those stakeholders, in particular learners, because also due to fast-changing reality, the learners are the ones to know the most what is necessary for them to teach. The, it wasn't changing so fast still a decade ago, comparing to now when it comes to the people really being aware what is necessary for them, but not really meeting the, the demands. Of course, it's a tough job. It's a, a, a functioning in the reality of a disruption, uh, also for teachers, for management, and so on. But unfortunately, that's the speed uh, we are existing in. Mm. A third one, it's adaptation of higher education institutions to the needs and their student body, population, teachers, stakeholders, broadening access to education for the wider part of society, and ensuring the good balance between the enhancement and accountability in quality assurance processes. Just for sake of uh, takeaway messages, uh, again, co-ownership and trust as a basis, enhancement orientation, long-term investment in those processes. So it's very important what you're all doing here as a quality community. I think that's, uh, that's always a, a noble work to do because we are often in the middle of all the you know, ropes being tied and, and people uh, playing with their own interest. But we are trying to really ensure some let's say, idealistic concept of quality education, but really the one that ultimately makes our societies better. And of course, the student-centered approach notion is a, is a good way to go, because uh, what else than the students at the center of our institutions should be? Uh, so that's my message, and that's the lunch, lunch message, I think, from me. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Uh, looking forward to speak with you, and any questions that you might have later on. Thank you.